So I don't want to scare you, but did you know that somebody checked a backdoor into Linux that allows the attacker to log into any Linux system? I'll tell you about that. And I'll also tell you about the time somebody tried to check a backdoor into MS-DOS and did it from my office. That's a cool story. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, we're going to talk about the new SSH vulnerability backdoor that's been inserted into Linux, what it means, how it works, and what the implications are, and whether open source is any better off than closed source in these types of scenarios. First off, obviously I'm not a Linux developer, I mean I write code for Linux, but I've never contributed, at least not since about 1993 when I checked in a bug fix to, was it Minix? I think it was early Linux. Um, or emailed it in, I should say. But suffice to say, I'm not a Linux contributor or developer. So while I may not be a Linux expert, that's probably good for you right now because I have to explain things in terms that I understand, which means you will likely understand them as well. So before we look at what happened, first, what are the implications? What does this backdoor do? Somebody checked in some code and it looks for a private key and it has a public key built into SSH. And what are the implications? Well, to put it simply, catastrophic. Had this not been detected as early as it was, it would have been truly catastrophic for Linux. Because let's say that this is a nation state. What they've done is they've built a backdoor private key into SSH that anybody with the public key, or actually it's vice versa, they put the public key in the product and then they hold the private key. Anybody who holds that private key and only that person, nobody else can use this exploit, I should be clear about that. Only if you hold the private key, which the original person who inserted the backdoor does, then you can connect to any Linux server with this backdoor inserted. In fact, you don't need a password, you just need to connect by SSH and the SSH server will say, hey, you've got the right private key in your metadata or whatever extra data is sent along with the login request. It matches that, logs you right in. Basically, not only a completely open door, it's even better than that because it gives you root access. That side of it's a little more technical, but suffice to say, the result is that you get unfettered access to any Linux system in the world that you want that's running this exploit, and you get root access. So how'd they do it? Well, what they did is they checked code into XZUtils. And when I'm saying they, I'm talking about one of the main developers of the XZUtils. The good news is this is in 5.60 and 5.61 versions of the XZUtils, and that's pretty much bleeding edge. It did make it into a few very early drops of distros, but not, it's not gonna be like in 20.04. It won't be picked up immediately or anything into there. So if you're not running on the bleeding edge, long story short, you're probably safe. But surely you can't put a price on your login safety. I wouldn't have thought so either, but here we are. So they checked code into XZUtils that, long story short, bakes the public key into SSH and then accepts connections from anybody with the private key. But wouldn't that be obvious? It seems like this should be obvious and easy to detect just by reviewing the source code change logs, but in fact it's not because they were very clever about how they did it. They didn't modify the source code at all. Instead, they injected encrypted and compressed binary data that is decrypted and then inserted into the build process via the make files for the XZUtils, if I understand it correctly. But this means there's no changes to the code, so anybody reviewing the source code changes doesn't see any change. And who reads make file changes? I mean, they're pretty obtuse and opaque to begin with, and if you have any idea what a make file is doing, it's either a simple make file or you're having a really good day because a lot of make files are pretty complex and hard to follow once you get to a certain complexity of a project. So at this point, we've got a backdoor in the Linux source code and all we have to do, or all they have to do, is wait for it to be propagated throughout all the builds and distros and trickle down to everybody. And if it doesn't get caught before that, boom. Hey, by the way, one thing I've noticed lately on YouTube is that people are like, bang, ending their videos immediately. And I guess this must appease the algorithm in some way. So I'm going to do that today, which means if I'm going to tell you the stuff that I tell you at the end of every episode, I have to tell you now like halfway through. So here it is. I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so if you're finding today's episode to be any combination of informative or entertaining, please leave me one of each before you go today. And if you or anybody you know is on the spectrum, then please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, where I tell you everything I know about autism that I wish I'd known way back then. So who caught it? Microsoft. Well, not really Microsoft guy that works for Microsoft also happens to do benchmarking and so on on the Postgres database, and he was running his tests and he noticed that the SSH logins were taking a lot longer than they used to, and that this happened all of a sudden. 
So he dug into it, and he's the hero that found the information and the back door and published it and let us all know about it. So had it not been for that, this would have likely been uncaught. Now, of course, this prompts the bigger question of which is more protective against this type of backdoor, an open source system or a closed source system? And I'd say in this case, the source code actually isn't all that relevant. Of course, it's open, but so is the makefile. Was anybody really scrutinizing the makefile? And if they had, would they have caught it if they looked at it carefully? Well, nobody even at Microsoft is probably hand reviewing and scrutinizing the makefile build code changes unless they cause a problem. If they slow things down, they're going to take a look at it. But if you make changes to the make file and the binary pops out and everything is cool, it's probably not going to get that much scrutiny, unlike a change to the actual source code that's going to go through several layers of review and approval. And again, I've been gone for Microsoft 20 years, so I'm talking about how we did it back 20 years ago, which was probably pretty sloppy and lazy and horrible compared to what they're doing now. But here's the beauty of a regimental commercial release. With something like Windows NT, you don't just check in code and then wait for it to show up in the build. It goes through a lot of processes in between. First, there's a build lab that picks up just your change, builds your change independently, builds a build with your change, kicks that out, and it goes through basic build. And when all the changes are collected for the day, that build will go through BVTs or basic verification tests. And that's going to check to make sure that all the normal stuff works, the smoke test past the build, boots does everything correctly, and that the performance is not seriously degraded from previous builds. And that's how it would have been caught early at Microsoft because the significant impact to the login chain would have caused the regression in win logon if it were, you know, the equivalent component in Windows, and that would have been detected immediately. Now, that's not to say that every such change would be. So, it's not a golden guarantee or anything. But the fact that any change to the product goes through both human manual review of the textual changes to the source code and then through a bunch of verification tests and benchmarks and several other verification tests that make sure the functionality and the performance hasn't regressed, that catches a lot of things. It still won't catch everything. Let's be clear on that. So there is no panacea. Now, the other thing is when you're checking into code, say I'm checking into the heap manager. Well, the guy who write, wrote the heap manager and the person who maintains the heap manager is going to very carefully check my changes. When you get something like XZUtils, I think there was only two people working on it. So did the other person really vet these changes very carefully or did Linus, you know, get out of his computer and check every line? I doubt that. So who is actually vetting these changes as they go into the build? And the answer is, I don't know, because I'm not involved in that process. So I can't really speak to what goes on behind the scenes in Linux. I can only tell you what used to happen in Windows, how you extrapolate that forward and assume they're more careful now and the protective aspects of that. Now, the difference is if it's in a part of Linux that a lot of people care about, a lot of people are going to look at it. But if it's in a part of Linux that a lot of people don't care about, like XZUtils, then it's probably not going to get the scrutiny that it deserves, especially when you see the implications of how this change manifests. So now, a bit of my own backdoor stories. When I was an intern in 1993, I was in MS-DOS, working on MS-DOS 6.2, where I worked on Smart Drive and HiMem and some of the compression engine relocation, disk copy, setup, a whole bunch of stuff. And there was a guy in my office that was also an intern, so we shared an office because we were just interns. And he decided that he was working, I believe, on the copy command, and he took the opportunity to check not a back door per se, but a special command line switch. So instead of, you know how with xcopy slash s will do folders? Well, with copy, he added it so that slash heart, which is like ASCII 254, I forget the actual OEM code page at this moment, but whatever it was, he used a special graphic character and he made that a command line switch and it would just print I love sex over and over and over and over and over. And it would print that out. I didn't know anything about this. And then after I'm done my internship, I get a call from my manager at the time who calls me at home and says, yeah, so what did you know about this? And the answer was, I knew nothing. And uh, naturally, they did not invite the guy back. It was caught in the manual source code change review that I spoke of earlier or however they caught it. And it did not look good for him. I don't know what the repercussions were. I don't know what they did. I wasn't involved. All I know is that they took me at my word that I wasn't involved. And thankfully for that, because I wound up working at Microsoft for a long time. And I don't know if I would have hired me after that little incident in my office. Did I really not know about it? I didn't. So now in all my time at Microsoft and in the two decades since over this course of 30 years of Windows and MS-DOS, to my knowledge, there has never been a backdoor inserted into Windows. Now, it's possible that one has and it's just never been found. But I would assume that by now there would be some exploit that would take advantage of it. Is that diligence, process, superior coding, or pure luck? Well, I'm going to guess a lot of it's luck, but a lot of it is process. 
It doesn't mean the developers are any smarter. It does mean that people have day jobs where they are assigned to look at code changes in other people's products, whether they want to or not, and they are responsible for anything that happens as a result of those changes, and that makes people pretty honest. And as for the people that aren't honest, there are processes and checks and balances to make sure they don't do a lot of harm. Thanks for joining me. See ya!